So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to this uh, second part of the systems track of this uh, ECCD 2020. So it's uh, my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, who is Salvador Casani, and he's gonna he's coming from uh, BioBAM Bioinformatics in Valencia, and he's gonna tell us about Paddock, a computational pipeline for the pathway reconstruction on the fly. So I would also like to remind you that you can address questions to the speakers through the web interface that the Congress is providing. And then I'm going to read all these questions aloud to the speakers for them to answer. So uh, thank you very much again. And uh, Salvador, the floor is yours. Thank you. So hi, everyone. My name is Salva Casanin. I'm a last year PhD student, and I'm going to present my work in Paduk. Uh, pathway computation pipeline for pathway reconstruction on the fly. Yeah. Biological pathways provide very powerful representations of biological processes. They represent connected metabolic or signaling reactions and offer frame functional units that are widely used by many bioinformatics software for functional biological data analysis. Uh, these pathways are stored in pathway databases after being created by uh, an extensive process of uh, subject that are an extensive process of creation. And uh, each repository contains different types of pathways and they're stored uh, with a very static structure and their boundaries are pretty much defined by the curator's choice. Um, the number of scientific publications grow exponentially and the pace of scientific discovery outlasts the pace of biological pathways being updated. Some information takes years to be included in the pathway databases, while we need it as soon as possible. For example, histone acetylation pathway is a, a, research, it's a research field that has been under constant research in the last 15 to 20 years, and for which we can find over 20,000 research articles uh, in PubMed search. Nevertheless, this pathway is not represented in CAG database, which is one of the gold standards in, in pathway. Uh, databases. Um, there is a broad diversity of pathway databases, including, for example, KF or Reactome. And this diversity is good because it gives us many more uh, ways of approaching pathways. But when we look for the same pathway, like the riboflavin metabolism in both KF and Reactome, uh, we see that the topology of the pathway is pretty different. And even they include very different metabolites in the in their structure. Uh, evidencing that the role of the curator is very important when defining the pathway structure. Well, given these limitations of pathway databases and the fact that they are crucial for scientific research, we have decided to create a tool that creates pathways and represented in pathway databases. To this end, we combine existing curated pathways information with new findings in the described articles. Uh, we combine information from different source databases to create a complete model with all cell molecular reactions. And we store the information in a very flexible database that allows visualization and fast retrieval of the information. This is Paddock's structure pipeline, pipeline structure where we can find two main models. On the left, we find a database extraction model where we extract information from existing curated pathway databases. And on the right, where there is an article extraction model where we extract info relevant information from the literature. And these two sources of information are combined to, prov to provide reliable and robust information with newest findings. To construct paddocks, tailored pathways, we use created information from pathway databases as the baseline for the reconstructed pathway. This created information is extracted from multiple databases and are combined in Neo4j graph database. The databases used include information from metabolic reactions, signaling pathway, or protein-protein interactions, uh, such as in string or intact, uh, among other types of information. This information is included in Neo4j, where proteins and metabolites are labeled accordingly. And information present in the database, such as the enzyme driving the reaction, are stored as node properties, as will be shown in later slides. Proteins and metabolites are assigned a stable ID, or, which are Uniprot and Chevy IDs, respectively, to allow retrieval of the information from Neo4j. The combination of these databases provide a very robust skeleton in which to construct the pathways of interest. To obtain reactions from text uh, research or from articles or research, Paddock structure relevant text using user keywords. 
and the proteins are metabolites are extracted from text using named entity recognition systems, banner and PMG. These systems extract uh, the name of the protein and metabolite and to make it comparable to information extracted from pathway databases, it must be assigned a protein or metabolite ID before adding it to neo 4 j Made from text are not standardized. They are the direct mentions of proteins or metabolites as they were mentioned in text. So an extra step of normalization is required in order to uh, assign the Uniprot or Chevy ID to these, um, to these elements that are added to the database. Text normalization is very common in natural language processing and consists in preprocessing the text in a standardized way that allows databases to assign identifiers to the, to the text. We assign the identifiers using Uniprot and Chevy databases, but not only these, we also uh, take advantage of the information that is already present in neo 4 j which includes all the information that was extracted from the databases that I just mentioned. And uh, we do text searches in, well, text similarity searches of the normalized names into the graph database structure in a way that we see, oops, sorry, we see which are the names that are, uh, can be compared with the, with the database uh, information. Um, this way we can assign a Uniprot or Chevy ID to the name, to the element that is extracted from text. So once the element is assigned an ID, it's introduced to the Neo4j graph database. Uh, what happens if this element is already present in the graph database? Well, we just uh, maintain the same node. We don't add redundant nodes now. And uh, we include uh, uh, the extra information found in Texas properties in the node, as will be shown in one sec. And uh, finally, uh, once entities are added to the database, the relationships that connect the proteins and metabolites extracted from text are also included in neo 4 j These relationships are extracted using TIS and Metricon software, which are uh, conv conv convolutional neural network based algorithms. And uh, we use them using different training models that are extracted from the BNL bio NLP uh, competition. And uh, these algorithms extract the unclassified the relationships and then are included in neo 4 j with the properties such as the sentence that was, the text was extracted from and, and so on. So this is the structure of neo 4 j after the information has been included. Uh, where we have nodes of proteins and metabolites. We have the relationships of uh, database or the text driven, driven relationships. And uh, each of the uh, nodes and relationships have um, uh, properties embedded in them, which describes them, such as the Uniprot ID, the sentences where they were extracted from, or the text where it was extracted. Uh, once entities are added to the database, or, uh, after the, so we have included a model in Neo4j with, that allows the capability of including multiple species in one search. This was thought for the creation of pathways in underrepresented species uh, in pathway databases and in research articles. Uh, this will allow to include a non-model organism with a model organism, infer the, the orthology through in paranoid, and then combine them in a graph database. After all the information have been, have been included in neo 4 j uh, Paddock retrieves the pathway using, oh, sorry, using cipher queries, um, which uh, extract the uh, proteins and metabolites and the relationships that are connecting them. Uh, these cipher queries are a non sql programming language that also allow to set filters of the number of times each entity has been uh, recorded in text and so on. So we tested Paddock using 14 E. coli pathways that are reconstructed and compared uh, with the ECOSIC created representation. Um, this Paddock reconstruction uh, we measure the sensitivity, which sets the number of elements from the original pathway that are present in our reconstructed pathway. We measure the specificity, which are the number of elements in our pathway that are present in the, in the original pathway. And we see that although many of the elements are covered in Paddock, a lot of information uh, present in Paddock is not present in the original database. Um, we wonder whether this was, um, this is uh, uh, relevant or unrelevant information. And uh, we manually created all the extra relationships that were present in this pathway and this reconstructed databases. So we, in the manual curation, we assign each relationship a rank from one to three, where rank one is low relevance and rank three is, is high relevance. 
And um, we see that with, especially with higher filters, rank, rank one or relevant relationships uh, outperforms the lower relevant relationships. We have also, we have talked before the histone acetylation pathways uh, and their underrepresentation of pathway databases, even though they are very important for recent research. This, um, this, we have created a histone acetylation in Homo sapiens with paddock, and uh, this is the result of paddock's reconstruction. We can see five main submodules of the, of the pathway that represent other signaling or metabolic pathways, such as P38, P53, FOX1 signaling, cycling regulation, or acetyl metabolism, which is crucial to the obtention of acetyl coenzyme, coenzyme A, which is uh, very important for histone acetyl transferase activity. And of course, we have uh, another submodule of histone acetyl transferases, which are the key part of this pathway. And uh, we have also created a citrus sinensis response pathway, being citrus sinensis a non-model organism. And we have included it in paddock with other model organisms, such as Agabidopsis thaliana. Um, we can see that most of the stress response pathways that are present here are ABA or hormone signaling pathways, uh, lipid signaling, as well as metabolic or sucrose stress metabolism as metabolic parts of the, of, the, of the plant that are involved in stress response. But one thing that catches our eyes is that although ABA signaling is present here, we see that it's, it might be incomplete for some experts in the field. Uh, one of the key advantages of uh, Neo4j is that all the information from the organism is present within the structure of the, of the database. Um, this way we can expand the network in any desired way. So if we expand the nodes that are related to ABA metabolism, we see other parts of the of the metabolism that weren't directly extracted through our query search, but are retrievable by user. Um, um, like if the user uses the Neo4j graph database to expand the network. Um, we can also see a connection to salicylic acid using, through some metabolism as well. And um, to conclude, I would like to, to say that Paddock provides a reliable and robust framework in which to create biological pathways ad hoc uh, Neo4j allows easy extraction and visualization of the pathway, as well as flexibility to traverse new nodes. Paddock pathways are tailored to the user needs, and also they require small curation. They summarize a huge amount of information that makes the curation reliable and time efficient. And uh, Paddock is publicly available at this link here. And I'd like to thank colleagues and collaborators that participated in this work. And, uh, thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I hope I can answer your questions. So thank you very much, Salvador. So indeed, we have time for a couple of questions. I will read them loud to you and the audience. So the first one comes from Rowan Howell. He says, great talk. What do you do about situations when there is disagreement in the literature about, say, the role of a protein in a pathway? So it's a good question. And uh, normally, uh, we capture, uh, well, there is no such a thing as disagreement here because there are many proteins that have an active regulating role on, for example, activating or deactivating a pathway. So also that might be seen as, uh, as uh, opposite, like that this shouldn't happen. This happens sometimes. So we capture all the information in the graph database and there is always the, this should catch the eye of the researcher and this might trigger like questions like this one, like, is this true? And as we always capture the information from text and from the databases, it's the role of the person to enter the, the node and decide whether the researcher believes both sources of information. But so far, what we have seen is that most of the reactions that we combine here that have opposite roles, they are true in both, in both cases. So we decided to capture all the information. I don't know if this was good answer the question. Yeah, good. We have another question from uh, Martin uh, Reinders that says, thank you for your interesting talk. Do you get similar specificity and sensitivity results when validating on something else than E. coli, for instance, in higher eukaryotes? Uh, I haven't tried that yet. We decided to go into E. coli because these pathways are much more like, uh, they have been created for much longer time. So we thought we would have a much robust framework in which to validate the tool. But of course, going into uh, mammals or even homo sapiens, 
will give us a much more uh, a result that will be much more relatable to some scientists. But this wasn't part of our of our validation so far. But that will be a really good step to take. Yeah. Okay, very nice, uh, Salvador. So we have a few more questions, but for the sake of time, we should move on. So I suggest that you go through them. I mean, I guess you can see them from the panel and maybe you can answer them uh, in a written form. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for the question. much. So our next speaker is Sergio Doria Belenguer. He's coming from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center and he's gonna tell us about probabilistic graphlets that capture biological function in probabilistic molecular networks. So, uh, Sergio, floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Patrick. So, my name is Sergio. I'm a second year PhD student, and today I want to talk to you about probabilistic graphics. But first of all, let me explain to you uh, why we want to use this, this kind of new technology. As oh, sorry, no, it's not working. Now, as Sala told us, um, omics technology is producing a lot of different kind of data, including in this case. What? Sorry, it's not working. I can see the slide now. No. Okay. Including interactions of biological entities for molecules. The way that we use this kind of data is by modeling it as networks. In a network, each molecule is represented as a node and its interaction between the molecules are represented as edges. The good point about these representations is that we can extract biological information from the acquiring patterns of the networks. And to do that, we can use graphlets and its orbits. So graphlets are small, connected, non-isomorphic, induced subgraphs for a large graph, and its orbits are concrete positions in the graphlet that accounts for symmetries. The way that we use this kind of technology is by counting the number of times that each node in the graph is touching one of these orbits. And then after that, we count, we will have a total number of counts for each of the nodes in the graphlet, and we can have a graphlet free vector with these counts. So, with this information, we can perform a lot of different experiments, including different kind of distances, such as the graphic degree vector distance that measures the, um, the distance between nodes in the same network, or for instance, the graphic correlation, the correlation distance that measures the distance between two different networks. Indeed, this kind of technology has been generalized to a lot of different kind of network models. And here in the slide, you can see some examples such as directed networks, hyper networks, temporal networks, etc. So at the beginning of this project, we were thinking of which kind of different data is available in the databases and how we can use it. So if you go to a database, you probably realize that normally the interactions between proteins are linked with a concrete weight. This weight can represent a lot of different things. And for instance, probabil probabilities. These probabilities at the same time can represent the uncertainty about uh, a molecular interaction occurring at some point, can represent uh, error or mistakes from the techniques, or sometimes it's just a part, an intrinsic part of the network. It's part of the nature of the network that we want to um, model. Until now, the way that we were using this information was by, was by using thresholds. So here in the slide, you can see this protein-protein uh, interaction, a real one from a string database. Here we have its edge probability distribution. And here in the table, you have some cons about nodes and edges. So normally, the way that we use this information was by choosing a threshold. In this case, we are choosing one this 0 0.7, which is the concrete threshold that is recommended by the database. And look what happened when we did that. So when, when we do that, look, here in green, we have those nodes that are gonna be kept in the final network by, in, and in red, we have those that are gonna be delayed. As a result, this is only the 43% of the number of nodes and only the 2% of the total number of edges that we had at the beginning. So we are losing a lot of information if we follow this protocol. So instead of using that, there is another option, which is include this information in a different model. So concretely in a probabilistic network model. Understanding a probabilistic network model is quite easy. You just have to think about in each interaction in this model, we have a probability of, uh, of the connection being existing. And something that is really important here is that because we have a probability of being connected, we also have a probability of not being connected, which is one minus this probability. So our contribution here was to develop a probabilistic um, technology in order to extract the local topology of this kind of models. 
and we call it probabilistic graphlets. Understanding probabilistic graphlets is quite easy if we focus in this example here. So just imagine that we have this small network that it's made of three different nodes that all of them are connected. And we want to count the number of times that we can find these three node graphlets, so line and triangle, inside of this network. So if we were using the normal graphlets, we only have one outcome, that is the triangle. But because we are using probabilistic networks, we have this, um, this feature about some connections can be existing or not. So instead of having just one outcome with this triangle, we are going to have a lot of different um, outcomes. Yeah, and in this case, for this example, because we are using three node graphlets, so not all of them are going to be valid. So here in green, we have those that for a three node graphlets are valid. And in red, we have those that are not. Why are why they are not? Because as you can see here, one node is disconnected. So this is not going to be a three node graphlet anymore. So let's focus on the probabilistic graphlets in this case, so in the green ones, and we start counting them. So for the triangle, we just have one option, which is all the probabilities, all the edges existing at the same time. But for the line, we have one option another option and a third option depending on which connections is not there so at the end of the day if we count probabilistic graphlets we're going to have expected values for each of the graphlets in the network and we can keep this information as the same way that we did for the normal graphlets in a big vector which name is the graphlet bigby vector again and we can perform with this information different experiments so let me explain you the first application which is the network distances for this application, we use it. We use uh, different synthetic networks from different uh, models of networks. So each of them with a concrete structure or topology. Then, for each synthetic network, we created two different versions of the networks. One which was probabilistic, and another one that was unweighted. And in the case of the probabilistic, we uh, randomly sampled. Uh, it's not, oh, sorry, we have luck. Okay, we randomly sampled the, the probabilities from the real distributions and randomly put this, this, these probabilities in the connections. Then, using normal graphlets or probabilistic graphlets, we compute the graphlet correlation distance. And here, uh, I can see my slides. There was an error message of insufficient memory. Yeah, no, I don't know. Hold on, it seems that Laura is trying to fix it. Okay, thank you. So we were here, we were trying to, to see if the graphic correlation distance using probabilistic graphlet or normal graphlets have any kind of difference. And here, what we can see is it's not here, it's a network that comes from the same uh, network model. So they have a really similar topology or structure, and the color represents the, dis the distribution of the probabilities in these networks. And as you can see here, if we use probabilistic graphlets, we can cluster the networks of the same topology by its distribution. Indeed, if we, instead of using ne networks from the same model, we use networks from all the models, we can see here how using probabilistic graphics, we can group the models by the structure. And also we have a small clusters that uh, groups the, the networks from the same model by the distribution. This, of course, as was expected, cannot be defined in if we use normal graphlets that only can group networks by its structure. So now let's check the second application, which is network clustering. And for the second application, 
we modeled different real molecular data as probabilistic and unweighted network. In this case, for this presentation, we're going to be focusing on protein-protein fractions of yeast, and we used two different confidence thresholds, which was the high confidence with a 0 0.7, the one recommended by String Database, and another, another one that was the low confidence threshold that keeps everything that we have there. So here in the table, you have different counts about nodes, edge, and density, and what we were modeling here was only physical interactions, only those that were experimentally validated, and the probabilities in this case represent the experimental evidence that we have. Then we calculate the graphlet degree vector using normal graphlets or, or um, probabilistic graphlets, and we calculate the distance using the graphlet degree vector distance of each node. Using this distance, we applied a CAMEL algorithm, and then with these clusters, we check if these clusters indeed had any kind of biological meaning by applying a go-term enrichment analysis of the clusters. For this presentation, uh, the results are only for biological processes, go-terms. So here in the table, we see each column represents a threshold. The first row represents the percentage of clusters that at least have one go-term enriched. The second one is the percentage of go-terms enriched. And the third one is the percentage of genes that are enriched. So clusters from zero to 100. And the colors in this case represents the networks. As you can see in these panels, probabilistic graphlets, which are the blue ones, capture as much or more biological information if we compare with the unweighted or traditional graphlets. Then we also check if this information was indeed similar or not by calculating the Jacquard index between the go terms that were captured by each of the technologies. So here we have the Jacquard index, again, clustered from 0 to 100, and the color represents the thresholds. And as you can see here again, probabilistic graphlets capture distinct information if we compare with the classic counterpart. Of course, the difference is even higher if we focus on this red one, the low one, because the networks we expect to be more different. Then we also check if indeed this information was more specific or not by calculating the mean of the level of the gold terms. So in this case, we have here the mean, here again clustered from 0 to 100. In this case, the groups, the color represent the go terms that uniquely were captured by probabilistic. In green, we have the interjection. And in orange, we have the classic, the ones that were captured by the classic uh, graphlet. And as you can see here in the high confidence or low confidence, in this case, again, probabilistic graphlets captures much or more specific information if you compare it with the traditional graphlets. Finally, our last experiment was to understand if indeed the go terms that were uh, differentially captured by each of the techniques came from different genes or not. So in this case, first we fix a concrete number of clusters and then we retreat the, the genes and, and compare it each of the other technologies. Here, the colors again represent the group. So go, uh, genes that were found only in the unique and probabilistic, the interjection is in yellow, and in green, those that are the traditional one. And as you can see here, probabilistic graphlets capture different information that comes from different set of genes or from the same set of genes, suggesting that maybe both technologies can be used in a complementary way. So as conclusions, um, the probabilistic graphlets in the case of network distances can differentiate not only by network topologies, but also by the probabilistic distribution of, of the edges, the priority of the probabilistic edge. And in the case of the network clustering, probabilistic graphlets allow us the analysis of all the variable data without using thresholds, if you don't want. I mean, you can still use it, but they allow you to analyze it without it. Then they robustly manage to extract low signal information. And this gives the ability to extract relevant biological information from this kind of networks. And finally, this experiment was not shown in this, in this concrete presentation, but if you check which kind of information the probabilistic graphlet is capturing, you will find that it's highly linked with the condition-specific processes. That if you think about that, it's kind of linked with this probabilistic nature of some interactions. So thank you. And uh, I would like to say thanks to all my team. And I'd be up to solve any questions you have. Thank you. Okay, Sergio, thank you very much for the presentation and for keeping the time and apologize for the problem with your slides. So coming from the BSC, I knew this running out of memory was not your problem. 
So we have one question here from Powerola that says, you're comparing unweighted with probabilistic. What about clustering using the weighted network? Hmm. Okay, so so I think if I understood correctly the, the question and... I, yeah. I don't really get it either, right? No. So I can help you, Mike. So maybe Pau can clarify it uh, in the text he sent. Hmm. I'll read again. You're comparing unweighted with probabilistic. What about clustering so, in the weighted network? Okay, so the thing is that I mean I don't I don't know if I understood correctly, but the thing is that okay we're co we are comparing which kind of information we are capturing with, with each of the of the technologies. So we just the difference is that we are getting this local topology using normal graphics from normal networks without this weight, and then we are obtaining the same with the modeling the, the same network as a probabilistic network. But in this case, you cannot use the normal graphics you have to use this uh, extension of the probabilistic graphlets. So then, of course, you're going to have two different matrix with different, with local, uh, the local topology information from different techniques. And then you use this to cluster first, one of the unweighted, and then the other one, you compare the clusters, the number of code terms, etc. I don't know if this is of the questions or was different. Okay, he, he is happy with your answer. So. Ah, okay. <laughs> so we have another question from Alfonso Valencia. He says, the good talk and interesting results. Can you elaborate on the origin of the weight? Can they be learned from the data? Okay, so this is a really good question. The thing is that, of course, depending on the data, you, so is the researcher the one that has to think about what are going to be represented the probabilities in your network? Because at the end, you're trying to model some kind of interaction. So the information that you put there, it's going to depend on what you understand as probability. In our case, for instance, we were using the um, experimental evidence for protein-protein interaction. But for instance, for the gene interaction, we were using the correlation, the prison correlation, I think one minus the prison correlation. So this is something that the researchers have to think about uh, what have more meaning for him in order to, when he's creating this network. If you can learn this, this probability, so the, or the representation of probabilities from data, I guess yes. Uh, we didn't do it, but it's a quite interesting uh, thing to test, of course. But in our case, we were, I think that you can do it, but we were, we were not doing that. We were trying to understand which kind of probability have more sense for us in each of the networks. Okay, thank you very much. And now for the sake of time, uh, we should move to the next speaker who is Alina Brent from the Computational Systems Biology Group uh, from Tübingen in Germany. And she's gonna tell us about how the flux balance analysis uh, reveals vinylate kinase as a potential target for antiviral therapies against SARS-CoV-2. So looking forward. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. I'm Alina Renz. I am a PhD student at the University of Tübingen. And I'm very excited to talk now about this potential target for antiviral therapies against SARS-CoV-2. So far now, I don't have to tell you that SARS-CoV-2 caused a worldwide pandemic we have at the moment. That's why we are meeting online today and not in person. It's this novel coronavirus SARS-CoV-2, which is, which is a single-stranded RNA virus. And its sequence became available at the uh, mid of January. With the sequence, we also learned that there are 29 viral proteins. And of those 29 viral proteins, there are 16 non-structural proteins. The current status that we have more than 24 million cases worldwide and over 825,000 pe people died due to SARS-CoV-2 infections. And in the middle of February, we decided we want to do something against this. We want to help to fight against this pandemic and try to identify antiviral targets. And during our research, we found this paper and the study about host virus interaction um, this was used as a guide for us. So Aller and his colleagues published a study in 2018 and they used integrated human virus metabolic models to predict host-based antiviral targets. So it was obvious which um, virus we want to use, SARS-CoV-2, but while we, now we needed a host model. And with further research, we found this human alveolar macrophage model, which formed the basis for the um, complete analysis 
This model was published by Bordbar and his colleagues in 2010. And this model of human alveolar macrophages um, was published in SBML level two format. It comprised more than 3,300 reactions and over 2,500 metabolites, um, no genes and no annotations. So in a first step, we kind of updated this model we, uh, to the latest SBML version and also added a lot of annotations to this model to further work with it. So now we have the virus and we have the human alveolar macrophage and now we have to integrate the virus into this uh, human model. And there we followed the pipeline and the virus biomass objective function comprises different requirements. So first we need some information about the genome of the virus and also about the proteins. So we need the replication method and also the number or the copy number of the structural and non-structural proteins. So how many copies of those proteins do I actually have? Then we were able to calculate the nucleotide investment. There we counted all the nucleotides for all the four bases. Um, we counted them and also including the genome copy number. We did the same for the amino acid investment. So counted every single amino acid which is required. And there we also needed to incorporate the number of these, um, the copy number of the structured proteins. This was a bit difficult and I will come back to this uh, in two slides. Uh, to polymerize the amino acids to form then the uh, proteins, uh, we need ATP, so energy. And for this, so we have to calculate the ATP requirements. And there we had a constant for the ATP requirement for a polymerization step, suggested also by Aller and his colleagues. Same accounts for the polymerization of nucleotides. There we have a pyrophosphate liberation. And there we also had a constant. And now with all those calculations, we were able to calculate the total viral molar mass, including the nucleotides and the amino acids. And with this total viral molar mass, we were then able to calculate the stoichiometric coefficients for the nucleotide investment, for the amino acid investment, the ATP requirements, and the pyrophosphate liberation. And with those stoichiometric coefficients, we could construct the final viral biomass objective function for nucleotides, amino acids, and the energy requirements. So now our model has two biomass objective functions, the host maintenance function and the virus biomass objective function. And those two biomass objective functions, we compared stoichiometrically. And there we found stoichiometric differences. So when you only look at those stoichiometric coefficients, you can see that some amino acids are required much more when you optimize for the virus compared to the host and other amino acids are required much less. For the nucleotides, you can see that the log fold change is um, always positive. So we need much more nucleotides when we optimize for the virus compared to the host maintenance function. These analysis already gave us a first hint what could be metabolically changed in a cell um, which is infected by SARS-CoV-2. So probably purine pyrimidine or in general nucleotide metabolism might be enhanced or altered at least. And also the amino acid metabolism is probably changed. But before we dive now deeper into the metabolic changes, I want to say something about the copy number. So this copy number of structured proteins was not known and it influenced the growth of the virus. So to investigate this influence, uh, we calculated the growth rate in relation to the copy number of structural proteins, varying from one to 1,500. And you can see here that around a copy number of 500, we somehow reach uh, equilibrium or steady state of the growth rate of the virus. However, we conducted all the further analysis with varying copy numbers to strengthen our findings. So let's go into metabolic changes. So the metabolism changes in alveolar macrophages upon infection. When you optimize for the um, host maintenance function and the viral biomass function, you get um, a change in different uh, compartments or in different um, pathways, especially in the transport of different um, requirements. We have a change in the amino acid metabolism as we somehow uh, expected and also the nucleotide metabolism changed. 
In total, 10% of all the reactions in the model changed uh, when optimizing for the viral biomass objective function. And this gave us a hint that metabolic changes can uh, be targeted for antiviral therapies. So we had two strategies to identify potential antiviral targets. The one was a more reviat um, approach, reaction knockouts. So we deleted every single reaction after each other and tried to identify reaction knockouts whose knockout did not harm the host cell, but harmed the virus biomass objective function. Another approach was the host-derived enforcement. There you're using a flux variability analysis to adapt the upper and lower bounds of reaction. And this rather simulates um, inhibitions, so not total blockages of reactions, but rather inhibitions or enhancements of uh, certain reactions. And with those two strategies, we identified the guanylate kinase as one of the potential targets. What you can see here is a table or an excerpt of the table of the host-derived enforcement analysis. So when you're down-regulating the guanylate kinase, you can see that the maintenance of the host is at 100%, but the growth of the virus is decreased to 50%. The guanylate kinase um, is part of the purine metabolism and converts ATP and GMP to ADP plus GDP. So this reaction is required for the nucleotide um, production. You can further see that we also um, have potential targets in the uh, um, amino acid metabolisms. These are exchange reactions for certain amino acids and also transport reaction. And it was suggested by the FBA analyses that when we upregulate those and that we also can decrease the um, viral growth why the guanylate kinase is now so interesting for us. Um, this was also one of the targets from the reaction knockouts. So when you knock out the guanylate kinase reaction, you still had 100% um, maintenance of the host cell while decreasing the growth of the virus to 0%, so to fully inhibit it. And that's why it was so promising for us. Now let's have a look at how the cell behaves um, when we are optimizing for both objective functions. So until now, we only optimized for either the virus biomass objective function or the um, host maintenance function. But uh, in this step, we did a linear combination of those two uh, with wa weights uh, varying between 100 and 0% of the host biomass objective function and the virus biomass objective function always combine summing up again to 100%. And on the left-hand side, you can see the panel uh, of the un uh, untreated cell. So we have the host maintenance and at 65% virus biomass objective function. So when we reach a certain threshold, the virus growth exceeds the growth of the, or the maintenance of the host cell. When we now, however, treat, the cell with uh, one of our um, approaches from before with the host-derived enforcement, you can see that at those 65%, the virus growth does not exceed the host maintenance anymore. They kind of coexist, but we still have a higher host maintenance rate compared to the virus growth rate. So even the um, maintenance where we only inhibit and not completely knock out the reactions seems to be promising. So what we want to do now and to kind of conclude this um, whole analysis, we have to look into further cell types. So, so far we worked on human alveolar macrophages, but there are ma many more interesting cells to look at because SARS-CoV-2 affects or infects many more cells. So we are working on building further models and then incorporate this viral biomass function into those models. Uh, we will have an eye on the copy number of structured proteins to decrease our target list even more. And currently the guanylate kinase and further potential targets are and need to be validated in laboratory experiments. 
With that, I would like to thank uh, the whole group of the Computational Systems Biology Department, especially um, Professor Träger and also Lina, who was a um, master student in our um, group during that time. And thank you very much for your attention. And I'm up for questions now. So thank you very much, Alina. Interesting talk. So uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is that this seems pretty uh, straightforward to validate in the laboratory, right? Yes. So uh, have you conducted any, any experimentalists to do that? And, and do you have preliminary results? Yeah, so there are um, experiments running currently, especially for digoenilate kinase. However, so far we don't have uh, results, but the experiments are running, yeah. Okay. So we have a question from Claudia Pomerenke. It says, school study, thank you for your talk, Alina. Would other XML models uh, interest, uh, would other XML models interesting for you? IT, some models are gathered at uh, fairdomehub.org. Yes, definitely. So um, when we looked in February, this uh, model of the human alveolar macrophages was uh, at a good state, but we are happy to yeah, to collaborate or to get further models of relevant human cells um, to yeah, further test our hypotheses and also our potential targets. So that's definitely uh, very interesting for us. Yeah. Okay. We have another question from Alfonso Valencia that says, interesting talk. Thanks. Uh, I may have missed it, but uh, how do you compose the biomass equation? Total virus or down to the different proteins? Accounting for the assembly? Yeah. So this was the, um, I, think, I think, third or fourth slide. So for the biomass objective function in general, it consists of all the nucleotides. So the four nucleotides are in the biomass objective function, all the 20 amino acids. We have the ATP requirements, so ADP is included, and pyrophosphate, and then water is in the biomass objective function. And then with the total viral uh, bio, um, molar mass, we were able to calculate the stoichiometric coefficients of each of these metabolites. Okay, very last one, because I know it's very uh, <laughs> easy to uh, answer. So Mikhail Anton says, very interesting work, Alina, have you considered open sourcing your model? The model is already available on Biomodels, uh, so it, you can already access it, and we also have a preprint of this work. So. Uh, have a look at biomodels there, you should find uh, this integrated model. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. So Thank we you now very much. to the last speaker of the session, who is David Merrill from the University of Wisconsin, and he's going to tell us about inferring signaling pathways with probabilistic programming. So David, the floor is yours. Hello. Good morning from Wisconsin. I think you can hear me, so I'll go ahead. Yeah, so my name is David Merrill. I'm from w University of Wisconsin. Uh, I'm also with the Morgridge Institute for Research. Today I'm presenting work entitled Inferring Signaling Pathways with Probabilistic Programming. So let's get into it. Yeah, so we're trying to solve a problem. Uh, here's the idea. Cells regulate themselves via complicated biochemical processes, which we call signaling pathways. You can think of a signaling pathway as a directed graph where the nodes are proteins and the edges indicate regulatory relationships between them. Our goal is to infer signaling pathways from time series phosphorylation data. In these slides, I'll use the variables X and G to denote time series data and graph structures respectively. So that's our problem. How do we solve it? We formulate the problem as a dynamic Bayesian network structure estimation problem. And we take a Bayesian approach. That is, we want a posterior distribution over graph structures conditioned on the available time series data. We decompose this posterior into a graph likelihood function and a graph prior distribution. Uh, we accept prior knowledge in the form of a weighted directed graph. The weight of an edge indicates our prior confidence that that edge exists. Uh, and this can be derived from pathway databases, such as KEG or Reactome, for example. Uh, the graph likelihood function is a dynamic Bayesian network. A dynamic Bayesian network, or DBN for short, 
is a sequential probabilistic model. For our purposes, you can think of one variable in one time step as being a noisy function of its parents in the preceding time step. And the dependencies between time steps are governed by the graph structure G. So this uh, dynamic Bayesian network is how we connect. So, okay. So this dynamic Bayesian network is how we connect the graph structures to the time series in a probabilistic fashion. Multiplying the likelihood in the prior gives us a graph posterior distribution uh, over uh, graph structures. And uh, this posterior allows us to make probabilistic statements about the underlying true signaling pathway, if all goes well. So we want to compute posterior probabilities, but that's easier said than done. We need an algorithm to help us do that. So in order to do that, we designed an algorithm called Sparse Signaling Pathway Sampling, or SSPS for short. SSPS is a Markov chain Monte Carlo technique. Uh, in other words, it samples from the posterior distribution by going on a random walk through the space of directed graphs. And that random walk is governed by a proposal distribution. Uh, our greatest contribution in this work, I would say, is that we designed a new efficient proposal distribution that acts on the parent sets of nodes and keeps us in the space of sparse directed graphs. This proposal distribution chooses one of three moves. It can choose an add parent move, a remove parent move, or a swap parent move, which is just a simultaneous add and remove. And this parent set, this parent set proposal distribution is efficient because we assign specially chosen probabilities to each of these moves. Uh, intuitive, and, and we choose these probabilities so that we stay in the space of sparse networks. Intuitively, it works this way. If a node's parent set is too small, then we assign high probability to the add parent move. If a node's parent set is too large, we assign high pro a high probability to remove parent. And if the parent set is about the right size, then we assign roughly equal probabilities to all of the moves. And that keeps us in the space of uh, sparse networks. So we implemented SSPS in Julia as a probabilistic program. Probabilistic programming is a methodology for building probabilistic models. It's based on, <clears throat> it's based on a key idea. Uh, you can think of a generative process as a sequence of operations on random variables, or equivalently as a program in a uh, special probabilistic programming language. Uh, and for SSPS, we used the gen probabilistic programming language, which is available as a Julia package. Uh, you can find our full code base on GitHub. The link is in the lower right corner. Uh, the repository includes our, all of our source code. It also includes a snakemake workflow for reproducing all of our results. So all of that sounds good, but we haven't talked about whether SSPS actually works or not. So in order to determine that, we tested SSPS on, on experimental and simulated data. I'll talk about the simulation study first. Uh, it, here's, here's, how the, here's how it worked. We would first generate a random network. Uh, you can think of this as the true network. And we would use this network to simulate some time series data. Then after we do that, we randomly add and remove a fraction of the edges from this network, uh, which yields a corrupted network. Then once we have a corrupted network and some time series data, we use, SP, you, we use SSPS to try to uh, infer the true network using this, uh, this corrupted network and the time series data. And we score the method uh, by treating this as an edge classification task. Uh, basically, we compare the predicted edge probabilities 
in the inferred network to the original uh, network. And we score this using area under the precision recall curve. So we, uh, so we compared SSPS on this task against a few different uh, established methods. Um, that includes a, another closely related dynamic Bayes net technique, uh, as well as a simple lasso implementation and a non-parametric uh, hypothesis test called Funk chi square And we compared their area under the precision recall curve uh, for edge classification. Uh, we also compared their computational expense. And uh, to make a long story short, uh, the performance for area under precision recall curve is summarized in these heat maps. Uh, to make a long story short, SSPS uh, attains superior area under the precision recall curve. Um, and uh, looking at these heat maps, uh, Blue is good and red is bad, and SSPS got a lot of blue, so um, I'll leave it at that for now. Uh, yeah, so that was the simulation study. Uh, the for the for for experimental validation, we uh, we we evaluated SSPS on experimental data from a dream challenge from a few years ago. Here's the idea of the challenge. There were 32 biological contexts. That's four cell types multiplied by eight stimuli. Uh, and for each cell type, or rather for each biological context, uh, we wanted to infer which phosphocytes were downstream of mTOR. Uh, in this image here, the yellow node is mTOR. The red nodes are experimentally validated uh, phosphocytes that are downstream of mTOR uh, in this context. And so the goal was to uh, predict these red nodes uh, from some time series data. The results, uh, and once again, we compared SSPS against some established methods on this dream challenge task. The results are summarized in these bar charts. Uh, these show area under the ROC curve. Uh, it's kind of a lot to see, but uh, here, here, here's the main takeaway. There, these are the 32 biological contexts, um, and on these, on the, on these, in these, uh, on this task, SSPS attained similar performance to the established methods, and so this, combined with the simulation study, uh, suggests that SSPS is a viable technique for uh, this task. So there are various ways we would like to improve SSPS in the future. Uh, some, algorithmic, some algorithmic improvements, like uh, we want to parallelize SSPS as much as possible. We've already made some progress on that. You'll see that in the repository if you take a look. Uh, we'd also like to have adaptive MCMC, where we tune the proposal distribution parameters uh, uh, to ensure maximally efficient sampling. There are also some modeling improvements we'd like to do. We'd like to incorporate interventions by using Perl's do operator, for example. Uh, we would also like to jointly model different contexts uh, so, that, uh, so that instead of treating those 32 biological contexts independently, for example, from the dream study, it would be nice if we could share information across those different contexts. Uh, so some conclusions to take away from this talk. SSPS infers signaling pathways by sampling DBN structures. Uh, SSPS improves on past DBN methods by using MCMC with a new efficient proposal distribution. Uh, SSPS performs comparably to established techniques on the dream challenge task, but the simulation study shows that it has better efficiency and scalability than other DBN methods. Uh, SSPS demonstrates the potential of probabilistic programming to model complicated biological systems. Uh, I have some references. I'd like to acknowledge my advisor and co-author, Tony Gitter, 
as well as funding from the NIH and NSF. I'd also like to acknowledge Stephen Hill from Cambridge, with whom I've had some uh, enlightening conversations. He did some foundational work in this area. Uh, with that, I am finished, and I accept. Uh, I, I'll take any questions. So thank you very much, David, for your presentation. So we have one question here from Pau Arola. He says, probably a naive question. Does the prior graph need to be acyclic? Uh, no, it does not. Um, yeah, so this, yeah, this, this method is definitely not restricted to uh, acyclic graphs. Um, the, the goal is to uh, identify a, or, or find a posterior distribution over, uh, over directed graphs generally, uh, not necessarily acyclic. Okay, very good. So if there are no more questions, we can break up here for lunch. So I would like to uh, thank all the speakers of the previous and this session, everybody that submitted the amazing work uh, to the systems track of the ECCB, and of course, uh, all of you for attending the session and uh, enjoy the rest of the meeting. So thank you very much. Thanks.